Heather Joseph. I'm the executive director of the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. That's why we call it SPARC, a little bit easier to say. And my story today is about open access, open access to scholarly journals, but open access really writ large as a concept. And um, oh, here's my little clicker. I'm going to talk today from the perspective of the library community, because that's what Spark actually is at its core. We are a, um, a membership organization of uh, academic and research libraries. And the library community really has, at its core mission, um, providing access to information, right? This is what we do. This is what you think of your friendly neighborhood librarian as, as providing. And this is really at the heart of, of, of what we're in business to do. And my organization has a very specific set of information that we're responsible for um, uh, providing access to. Um, because we're libraries that are really housed on college and university campuses, um, we have to make sure that our folks get access to scholarly and scientific material that they knew, need to do the work that they're tasked to do on campus. Um, and the work that they're really tasked to do on campuses includes you know, doing original research, scientific research, but scholarly research of all kinds of stripes, and also teaching students is the second half of uh, the work that they're tasked to do. So it's our job, really, as a library community to be able to connect people in an unfettered, barrier-free way with the best possible, the latest and the greatest information that they need to do their jobs, right? It's, it's not just a job also to the library community. Act, providing access is a core value for us. And for a long time, this really wasn't you know, too big of an issue for us to be able to do effectively. Um, after all, the material that scholars and researchers produce, they produce specifically with the intent to share, right? Authors of, of, um, that publish in scholarly journals aren't paid for writing in journals like authors are paid for a screenplay or for writing a textbook or, um, or, or uh, uh, any other type of a book. They produce this information with the expectation that it's going to be shared widely in order for the discipline that they're working on to advance, right? I mean, that's sort of the beauty of the cumulative nature of the work that we do as scholars, is that the only way ideas gain in value is if you can share them to the widest possible audience, and they can be built, used and built upon. Um, I love this George Bernard Shaw quote, because I think it illustrates that so beautifully. Um, so really, it shouldn't be too much of an issue, right? This is scholarship that's kind of provided in this circle of gifts economy. Well, over the last couple of decades, Houston, we really do have a problem. The nature of um, uh, getting access to this information completely changed for us. Um, and that's really because the primary source for us accessing this, the, the, the materials that report on scholarship, these scholarly journals, um, the price of these journals has, I, when I use the word skyrocketed, I, I, this doesn't even begin to describe it. I've, I've done this talk so many times, and oftentimes I don't even use a slide. I just say, blue line is the consumer price index, so imagine this line being the consumer price index, rational sort of price growth. Red line is the price of journals. Modern interpretive dance here, this is a big gap in what we're able to provide access to in terms of what should be a no-brainer that people need to do the work of, of um, scholars and researchers. Um, and in case you're curious why, it's really not a secret. Um, the scholarly journal, our little circle of gifts economy, has been commercialized by multinational corporations who saw that there's gold in them, their hills. And um, uh, these, these folks got into the publish, large publishing houses got into the game in the late 70s and have turned our little community into um, a, roughly an $8 billion a year revenue producing industry. And in case you're curious for a comparison, another $8 billion revenue producing industry is the NFL. So we seriously do have a disconnect in terms of the commercialization of this layer of information and our ability to provide this to our campuses to provide the best possible education. So that little curve, that red curve that goes straight up, no secret, there's no library on earth whose library budget has gone up at that pace. So we're left with a huge gap in what we can provide to our teachers, our professors, our students, our researchers. It's not just a library problem, right? It's a problem for the entire community. Um, uh, so the library community, of course, wanted to do something about this, right? We wanted to take action. But you might sort of rightly ask, what could a relatively small community of, well, you know, librarians do to take on such a big problem, right? An $8 billion industry is not something that's going to roll over and say, please, take our profit margins. But it turns out that librarians are pretty, pretty darn good at leveraging the power of collective action when it comes to promoting or protecting core values of theirs. And access to information is truly a core value of our community. 
So we really wanted to work on a strategy of figuring out how to leverage collective action around this core goal of action. Um, so we focused on the end game, right? We focused on articulating our community shared desire for and value of equitable access to information. And we used the emerging concept of open access as a, a way to define our vision of how we think this information should be and could be and should be uh, shared and accessed. Um, open access is a pretty recent concept, if you haven't heard of it. Um, it really came about because of the unique opportunities we have with technology allowing us to distribute this kind of information electronically at you know, little or no marginal cost. Um, and it allows us to do things and think about doing this much differently than we ever could in a paper-based world. It really was only um, established in about 2002 as a concept for distributing this, this layer of information. Um, and a really key aspect of the idea of open access and what allowed us to kind of take this and build on it is the fact that it's a really clear definition. Um, open access, when we're talking about it, means something very specific. It means being able to freely, immediately access this layer of research, the articles that scholars have traditionally produced without expectation of payment, um, freely on the internet, and also to be able to use them in the digital environment the way that we want to use them. We usually say you know, that, that it's the access coupled with the reuse rights, and I love the way um, Mark phrased it this morning, that we usually say to let you customize it, uh, the use the way you want it, to use it. But now I think I'm going to use to let you scratch whatever itch you might have and, uh, and might want to scratch. I think that's a great way to, to put it. So having this concept really gave us an opportunity to say, OK, we're, we're a decent, you know, small community to decent size, but there's a lot of other people that share the value of access to information. And if we can define that this is the vision of the end game that we want to get to, right, free immediate access and being able to use this stuff the way you want to use it, we should be able to bring in like-minded people to help us work towards that goal. Um, so what we did was to reach out beyond the academic community. Of course, we reached out to the, the, the folks on campus and the students and things. But there's also a much wider base of people who care about access, um, people in the healthcare disciplines, physicians, patients, patients advocates, small business owners, any kind of entrepreneur. And we focused on demonstrating how opening up access to this layer of information would ultimately really benefit each of these groups, right, both individually and, and um, collectively. And what we did was essentially create an action plan for moving with these individuals towards that vision of open access. These were individuals that naturally held the value of open access, but had no central place to go to express it. And what we ended up finding out was that this resulted in something much bigger than just an action plan, although that was important. We created a coalition, but really a community of folks who really passionately care about access to information, and this information in particular. Having this really clean, tight, well-articulated objective as our centerpiece, um, uh, and then having this great number of groups coming together saying, yeah, these are principles we can sign on to underneath this umbrella, it allowed us to, to really be poised to act, to craft, to craft an action agenda that's centered around very simple things, very aggressive, but very simple campaign of educating anybody and everybody who will listen about what open access is and what opportunities, opportunities it presents really focusing in significant resources to make sure that we're going to ask people to talk the open access talk. We better damn well make sure that there are outlets for them to be able to walk the open access talk. Right? If we're going to say publish in open access journals, we better establish open access journals. So we were very aggressive about that. We were also very aggressive about creating an advocacy campaign for real policy changes on a level that would allow us to establish open access not just as an alternative for access to this information, but to move it to um, uh, the, uh, the position of a norm, that this is the way we as a collective community now demand to have access to this information. So we used open access as the core value, and we really only used two tools to scale up, right? We used the power of the network digital technology, the web and related tools, and the strength and numbers and the talents in our coalition, the individuals uh, who are part of it to scale up. And we created basically two groups in the coalition that we use as the public faces of our coalition. We represent, I, I, we've lost count now about how many millions of individuals are represented by the large umbrella group, the Alliance for Taxpayer Access, which is essentially our citizens group that does full-scale lobbying for policy changes that will enable open access. 
Um, and the second group that we have, and, and, and the only reason that they're separated out was that the students really wanted their own more student-y branded movement. So we, we also work with and sponsor the Students' Right to Research Coalition, which is about 5.5 million students now in the US and Canada, and we're working to scale that internationally as we speak. Um, what's been phenomenal is how they've really held true Imagine that all of the world's information was available to you for free, online, and unrestricted. You wouldn't have to spend so much money on textbooks and course packs. You would always be able to access that perfect article for your research without worrying whether or not the library has a subscription or waiting for interlibrary loan. You could build on that information through reuse and mashups without worrying about copyright restrictions. This is what open access is all about, making scholarly information widely available to everyone online at no cost to you. Open access empowers you to demand access to the information you need to receive a quality education. Open access also ensures that researchers can share their knowledge and have access to the most current research in their field. Open access to scholarly information makes it a better world for everyone. For more information, visit the Right to Research Coalition. Thank you for taking a library minute. We're working with you to unlock access to the information of the world. I literally found that video when I was preparing for this talk. We had nothing to do with creating the video, but the messaging is straight out of the Open Access Movement playbook, right? So it's a phenomenal example of the students working with their library, working with the larger education community to get the message across and finding the right medium and the right channel to, uh, to put it out there. Um, so uh, as a result of the, the work with these coalitions, um, we've had some pretty good successes. And I wanted to, to wrap up and, and finish up this talk today by sharing with you just three very quick examples of successes that demonstrate sort of the scale of um, what a little group of librarians can do and when, when, you, when, you, when you join with the larger community and kind of set your mind to things. I think they're great examples of scale and scope. Um, uh, Lisa actually kind of tipped my hand on the first one um, we talked about the importance of, of infrastructure, right? The importance of making sure there were outlets for our scholars to be able to um, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Uh, this, this morning, the directory of open access journals, which is a great site that collects and catalogs all of the different outlets that are now available for scholars, actually notes that there's more than 5,800 you know, established uh, journal outlets in the open access environment for scholars to pick and choose to publish in, in a variety of disciplines. Um, what's really important about this, though, is that when we started talking about open access just in 2002, there were a couple of dozen. So you can see how fast the investment in this infrastructure has been made and how quickly it scales up into something that can really work to support meaningful change. The second example of scaling up is a success that we've had in the policy environment. Um, we really worked with the coalition for a strength in numbers approach uh, to, uh, uh, to go at this issue very aggressively. And you might, or you might not, I don't know, be surprised to learn that librarians actually have a very rich history of being unafraid um, in terms of engaging with policymakers on issues that might be slightly controversial. Uh, certainly, the library community played an enormous role in protecting privacy, and, and, and this is one of my favorite t-shirts. Librarians, the thin blue line between you and the FBI. It's not, you know, it's not a joke, really, with the Patriot Act that was the library community that put their butts on the line to say, this is wrong, you know, privacy need, there, there are real needs for privacy, and in terms of access to information, this is a place that the community did and continues to take a stand. So it's kind of in the library community's DNA, and we were able to percolate that up to work with our larger strength in numbers coalition to select a, um, a, an opportunity, a policy opportunity, to uh, really illustrate how, what, what can happen if you unlock a specific layer of information. And the layer of information that we chose to focus on was the $30 billion of research funded annually by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and we, we worked an aggressive, full-scale, you know, Washington-based lobbying campaign to uh, try to get a policy in place that would require anyone who received that funding that wrote an article to make those articles openly accessible. Um, in terms of the success, we actually had that policy codified into law through the congressional appropriations process in 2008. And as a result, there's more than 700,000 articles that are now openly available reporting on biomedical research from the NIH. And the, the, the usage is phenomenal, right? Over half a million individuals hit that database every single day. And there's nothing in that database but articles on biomedical research. 
And the last thing and the thing that I want to close with is, pro is probably our most um, uh, uh, striking uh, 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 example of scale. Um, in 2008, we had the idea that wouldn't it be great if we could convince some college campuses to set aside some time during one day to talk about open access to raise the profile and awareness of this issue. So we announced our attempt at creating something called Open Access Day, where you'd have a program on your campus. And what we did was, this was the sum total of our, our crazy press for Open Access Day, a press release that said, we encourage you to hold an event on your, on your campus. We created a canned video. It was a good one. It was a Nobel Prize winner and uh, the head of the largest biomedical funder in the UK. And we made it available to the community. Well, the community came back. The network came back and said, that's not enough. Um, we think we can do a lot better. We'd like you to act as a central point provide more openly accessible resources like that video, give us a place as a community to come, and allow us to do this across time zones. So you see our latest is Open Access Week that was just celebrated the last week of October. And it's not facetious to say everywhere, because we had events that were held in uh, the National Academy of Sciences in China. We had events that were held in Kenya. We had events that were held because of the, the community establishing these events at Bibliotheque Alexandrina and the National Library in Egypt. We had events in South Africa. I love this one because it's competitive now. Harvard likes open access, so University of Pretoria is going to like it. Um, and all over the Far East as well. Uh, so the thing about scale of this event is that from 12 events that were held on one day in 2008, this year, over the course of a week, we had 94 countries celebrate this event. And this was all brought to you courtesy of Spark 4.5 people. So I hope this has inspired you to know that no matter where you're placed in the community or how large or small your, your organization is, you can scale up and you can have real effect in creating a system of education that works equitably for all of us. Thanks so much for letting me be a part of this.